So, so Karen, how many of these uh, meetings have you guys done so far already? Um, when did they start, um, Roberto and Karen? It was in um, March. So we started. Oh, we go. Here we go. Set um, uh, six. According yeah. To the right, right when we started to go. Actually, it was right after we canceled. April twenty fifth was our first meeting. No, that was our fourth meeting. It was right after no, Cambridge yeah. canceled. Yeah, I think it was. Um, oh wait, the first, April third. April third. First weekend was of April. Person. Yeah. So April yeah. I I don't know if you know, but we've we've had Ben and Colin on, we've had Simone and Chad, Dave Weinbach, uh, Scott Golden, um, Ron and Melody, you and Melody. Yeah. Oh, and Melody and I. On the and Sam. On the Bassfords. And the Bassfords. On. Right. Oh, nice. So you guys are virtually Hi, meeting a bunch of new people. Yes, that's 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 right, Irina. It's actually been really nice. So. Um, nice. Why well, know you, Karen? You know, Irina, what's the? the US. I'm sorry, Irina. Say that again. Um. I said that you met you met some of them at the tournament um, in Florida, but for the yes. most part, for everybody else, you guys yet to meet them in person. <laughs> ne ne next I'm week we sorry. have next week we have Randy Coleman. Oh, nice! Yeah, Randy is my buddy. He's super chill. I've got to tell everyone a, a lovely <laughs> story about Irina. Actually, uh, she just mentioned the World Championships. Chris and I went there um, in December. Um, Sarah was there as well, um, and uh, Chris entered a um, uh, a pro senior pro event. So he got a um, pro um, ticket, but so he could go and watch all the pros games. So he got a pro ticket. Um, but I obviously wasn't entering a, a, a pro event, so I didn't get one. So Irina gave me her pro um, ticket. So I was actually able to watch from close up um, and talk to a lot of the pros there. And that was just because um, Irina was such a sweetheart and she gave me her ticket. And I will be forever grateful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irina. No problem. I just like breaking the rules sometimes, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you know that. <laughs> hey, like, can can anybody hear me? Hey, Jimbo, welcome. Oh, Jimbo, he's yeah, here. Hello, hello, Irina. Oh, hello, you, you big hello. rule breaker. I like breaking rules too. I love breaking rules. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and uh, it's good to see you, Irina. Yeah, good to see you too, Jimbo. Yeah, good to see you, sweetie. Um, uh, everybody should be coming to Minneapolis to support support okay. what's happening here. We have a big problem here. Yeah. Or the riots. Not nice. Not nice. Oh yeah, lots of lots of problems here. I hope you're not near it. I am near it. Yep, I am in it. I've been in part of the protest and uh, part of the people trying to get changes done. Yes, I'm very much that's in good. That's good. Yeah, I, See, that's been... exactly why I'm in the woods hiding from all of this. Just don't yeah, start you... any fires, Jimbo, okay? Uh, no, I didn't put out, put <laughs> out or, put, or start any fires, but I was next to them. I've been talking to the police. I've been talking to the crowds. I've been in right in the thick of it with my bicycle. I've traveled all over. And uh, it's a very scary thing. Very scary. All right. So we Hello, have everyone. 29 participants. I think we should get going. Um, I'm going to spotlight um, Irina. I'm going to ask everyone. Um, to uh, go on mute unless you're asking a follow-up question to Irina. I sent some questions over earlier. Uh, oh. And the first question, um, Irina, was where in Russia are you from? I am from Moscow, from, from the capital of all capitals. Has anybody been? 
Okay. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I've listened to the the Bolshoi Opera and the Bolshoi Ballet. Absolutely. That's the way to go, Jimbo. <laughs> you got it, baby. We we'll go there next year together. Yep, we'll introduce some good pickleball to those guys. We'll, we'll the show them. Yeah, right it right outside the Bolshoi uh, opera and uh and ballet. We'll set up a court and we'll get those people addicted to pickleball. <laughs> um link to the first question. What was it like to grow up in Russia, Irina? Hello, Irina. You're on mute, Irina. Oh. Did I miss a question? Sorry, it bounced me out for, uh, for one right. second. Okay. Um, I was asking, uh, what was it like to grow up in Russia? Um, yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, I started playing sports from early on, and I started playing tennis um, when I was six and a half. I started school and tennis at the same time. And then uh, shortly after that, I went on my first uh, trip abroad uh, with my tennis friends, and we actually went to England. And we hung out a few days in, um, yeah, in London, and a few days uh, we stayed at an abbey in our Norwich. And uh, after that, I thought tennis is the greatest sport ever. I can travel everywhere, be away from my parents, hang out with my friends. Um, so, yeah, that was fun. And then um, in Moscow, I just went to school, and then in the afternoons, I went to tennis practice. And then I just tried to hang out with my friends and um, break some rules, get in trouble. Yeah, you troublemaker, you. <laughs> Do you want to elucidate, you know, sort of tell us more about getting into trouble or not? <laughs> yeah, good idea. Um, let, well, I told, um, I told my phys physical education teachers probably in like fifth grade that uh, I don't think I should attend PE classes because I already play tennis and I'm on a very serious track. And... Um, you know, maybe I can just show, show up whenever I feel like. And they told me it was okay as long as I play a little bit of basketball, like run for the school and uh, swim for the school. I had a free schedule for the next six years. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, when did you move to the U.S.? So I got to U.S. Uh, after I graduated high school, so at the end of 2000. And um, I came to play college tennis. I uh, went to play at Texas Tech University. I don't know. Do you guys have a college or like university sports in Europe? Yes. Nice. So, yeah, I thought it was a great opportunity. I can go to school for free, um, play some tennis, hang out. I didn't really know how the system works. So it took me. I was learning as I went. Um, but yeah, I had a pretty good time, even though I was in the middle of nowhere in Texas. Actually, uh, Randy Coleman, who will be a guest next time, is from Lubbock, Texas, and that's where I went to school at Texas Tech University. So, oh, wow. well, that brings us on yeah. nicely to um, who um, introduced you to pickleball. It wasn't Randy, was it? No, it wasn't Randy, but it was another living legend, uh, Chris Miller. I don't know if you guys know Chris. He came to the very first uh, Bainbridge Cup a few years ago in Madrid. And uh, yeah, he's my really good friend. So he used to live in Seattle, Washington, and uh, he introduced me to pickleball there. And I played it. I hated it. I thought it was like the <laughs> stupidest thing ever. <laughs> And I was about to never play again. And Chris Miller told uh, my friend Denise, who you guys, uh, you guys met actually in, um, in Florida. So Chris told Denise and I that he bought us flights to play the Tournament of Champions, which is the first, the original Grand Slam with a pretty good prize money for pros here in the U.S. Um, and he said, I guarantee you will win. And if you win, you can pay me back for the flights. And if not, no worries. But I arrange housing for you. I got you guys flight, so just go play the tournament. And I was very surprised, and uh, I wasn't really trusting Chris. So I asked him, he's like, who is this guy? Can we trust him? He's like, yeah, let's just try it out. Go to the tournament, check it out. And uh, that was basically it. My first uh, tournament was a Grand Slam event for prize money, pro division, and I played pickleball two times before um, I played that event. Seriously? 
Wow. And did you win? Did you win? Well, uh, first event was women's doubles and we lost two matches in a row because we had no idea what was happening. We um, kind of, we didn't know the rules. So we kept uh, serving before the score was called or oh. we kept serving from the wrong side, very much like the most recent Spanish Open that we played in. Um, and then it was pretty funny. So then we played some rec games and mixed the next day was a little bit more fun. Uh, we actually won some matches. And then the third day was singles. And I kind of figured out how to play it. And um, I was actually able to win singles. I played Christine McGrath in the finals. And I pay paid uh, Chris Miller back because I probably won like at least $1,500. It was good prize money, even though oh, it was wow. like maybe five years ago. Yeah. Nationals uh, was also happening at that same time, but they didn't really have any prize money until maybe four years ago and then for the longest time nationals was the lowest prize money and then they decided they need to keep up with the tournament of champions and uh, the u.s open so since nationals has been at the indian wells they really upped their prize money game and made it like a really premier event um, i don't know if any of you guys had a chance to uh to attend this tournament but it is super fun like one of the best uh facilities for tennis in the world and you just kind of hang out so I'm really glad the transformation I was able to witness and maybe be um, a little bit part of the transformation of Pickleball and uh, I think we're going to keep growing and um, so many things ahead of us. Yeah Louis and Thadia came to the Nationals last year actually from um, England uh, and in fact uh, Carolyn. Yes and I think Guy was there too right? Um, I'm not sure if I was there with them uh, as well. He may have well have been. Uh, I think so. Right. Oh, great, great. And um, there's been one, what, uh, there's been a, an old man who's been at every nationals. <laughs> that wouldn't be you, would it? Jimbo? Yeah, Jimbo was there too. <laughs> yeah, that's the the old man. But I have to go and watch Arena. She doesn't play with me. Um, she just uh, will hit a few balls and then say, uh, "Well, I now got to play with." Uh, uh, some of the pros, Jimbo, some of the pros. <laughs> yeah. Are you saying she does okay. a couple of pity, pity balls with you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Sweet. She's, she's a sweet Yeah, the question, woman. Arena. Mm -hmm. Jimbo had a question, but I'll, I'll let him ask you that question and now he's here. <laughs> which, which was the question I had? I talked with you earlier, Roberto about uh, intergenerational play <clears throat> is that the one yeah yeah well one yeah. of the question was um you know uh, why you know why don't you why don't you choose jimbo to play with in the in in, a, in the tournament <laughs> yeah, why, uh, oh for the Bainbridge cup because i had better partners lined up uh, to play. yeah quite honest right <laughs> See if I ever hit with you again, boy. Yeah. See if I ever hit with you again. You ask a question like that, you're bound to get an answer like that, you know? Yeah. I, I, I know. It it was a complete setup for defeat. Yep. Yeah. But uh, my my view my view is that we should have some categories of intergenerational play, and I wanted Arena to comment on that. So where we would have hypothetically. Uh, a combined age of, let's say, 110 or 120, and you would have someone from uh, from uh, 60s playing with somebody with, uh, you know, in their 30s or 40s. Whether that is something which you, Irina, think uh, would be healthy for the growth of the game between the generations, rather than just the pros playing together <clears throat> and uh, strictly broken into age groups so anna so anna lee would need a 90 year old partner <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you know, what, whatever <laughs> and they would be playing against a 90 year old and a 25 year old yeah whatever yeah well i think um i think there's definitely some merit to it um one of the uh things that i think kind of is a little bit prohibitive right now is the rating system in the u.s so if I want to play in a fun tournament and play with my friends or whomever and not worry about the result and just have a good day, um, technically it's going to affect my rating, right? And then it can result in maybe not getting seated at a bigger tournament. So 
we're actually working a little bit maybe on a ranking system and counting if you maybe your best uh, nine or ten tournaments. I don't know if um, Colin Johns and Ben Johns talked about it at all. So that way, if I play 20 to 25 events in a year, but only the best 10 results count, I definitely have a lot of freedom to kind of mingle with everybody, try to grow the game, because I think it's absolutely essential to have events like this. Like I was really looking forward to playing with Jamie in, yeah. um, in the Bainbridge Cup. Yeah. Um, and US Open was actually going to have a, a little bit of a small amount of prize money. And I think just a pro level mingle where you had to play with a pro over 50. Unfortunately, it didn't happen this year, but I was kind of excited. So, um, yeah, I would definitely encourage it. I think uh, Bainbridge Cup is a fantastic opportunity to actually execute some uh, multi-generational play. And uh, I had a privilege of playing, yeah, with some uh, some juniors and some uh, some more distinguished partners in the past. And uh, <laughs> I'm, planning, I'm planning on doing that <laughs> as well. You mentioned I like the, I like the use of I like the use of your term distinguished. Thank you. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> you mentioned the Bainbridge Cup, Irina. You've actually been at all of the Bainbridge Cups. Um, is that because you really enjoy the event? Uh, yes. Unfortunately, I had to skip the one in Germany last year, but um, oh, even that. Sorry. Yes, but um, I enjoy. Um, you know, I traveled to, to Europe a little bit when I was a tennis player, and uh, I enjoy the culture. I enjoy the people. I think uh, I enjoy being away from maybe our traditional like U.S. kind of circuit and circle of friends and just kind of going to Europe and hanging out with you guys and um, meeting new people. So that's a huge uh, factor in me choosing just the social aspect um, of competition and meeting everybody. And uh, I like the format. I like the between the countries battle. Uh, and uh, I really anticipated a victory for Team Europe this year. Yeah, so, I don't know if you guys, uh, when you talk to Lucy, if you were able to recruit Lucy Kovalova to represent Europe maybe next year. We, we did. Um, she but, said she would try. Yeah, she did. Hey, and Karen, I'll mention that Irina didn't make it to the German Bainbridge Cup because it was scheduled at another time. She's the one that told me that we needed to schedule it when there wasn't something happening big in the United States. Okay. So, yeah, that's where that came from. Brilliant. So, um, and then if, uh, what I have a question, Karen. And sorry, forgive me if that information is already out there and somehow I missed it. So, is uh, Bainbridge Cup happening in England next year, like around the same time? Or are you guys still looking for uh, a date? Or? Okay, so, um, this is an exclusive reveal. <laughs> um, we had a meeting uh, with Ron and Pat and others. Um, about the Bainbridge Cup for next year. And the conclusion of that meeting is that there's so many unknowns around next year right now. And um, our perspective is that um, in order for the Bainbridge Cup to be successful, we need players from Europe and North America and other countries coming along to it. And we're not convinced that travel is gonna be back to where it was this next summer. So we have asked to skip to 2022. So we will not host it next year. I'm not saying there isn't a Bainbridge Cup next year, but England won't be hosting it next year. We would like to go for 2022. Got it, <clears throat> got it. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Makes, uh, totally makes sense, gotta, gotta be careful. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's more the fact that we had over 700 registered players for the tournament. If we then went out for next year and we got, say, 350, you know, it's going to feel disappointing, right? So we really want it to be, you know, the best event it could possibly be. And so for that reason, we're, we're electing to go 2022. I don't know if you want to say anything else, Ron. Um, you know, there's... Pat and I are talking about having a Bainbridge Cup next year just in the U.S., U.S., Canada, Mexico, um, just because of the travel restrictions and the unknowns. So we don't know, but we're committed to England for 2022 as long as we can all come to an ar arrangements and agreements, and, and it will be awesome. That's all I've got Okay, so the next question that was on the list, Irina, um, was could you talk us through your top 
drills or your favorite training drills? Um, well, oh, I think Irina's frozen. Not as in cold, but her screen has frozen. <laughs> I'm back. All right, brilliant. <laughs> All right, so favorite training drills. A uh, little bit of background before. Um, I probably not really the person who is into drilling and uh, training, uh, but everybody has their own pathway. Uh, my philosophy is that you have a continuum, you have a learning continuum, and the first part for me is to understand the area or the concept that I'm working on conceptually. And then the kind of the next step is maybe practice it through drills. The next step is practice it in the rec play. And then the next step is practice it in the tournament. And I usually skip a bunch of steps. So I kind of think uh, maybe of level one and a nice concept. And then I try to go right into rec games or tournaments and try to, um, to execute it. But, um, one drill that I found is very, very important, uh, and especially for kind of maintaining my footwork and maintaining my ability to lunge and be explosive um, from my split step is just dinking in the kitchen single style. So one-on-one, -on -one, every shot has to go in the kitchen and you just kind of move around, play games to 11. So it's very physically demanding and it helps you um, stay disciplined when you're off balance, when you're reaching for the shots. And it's good not only for singles, but also for doubles. If somebody hits a dink in the kitchen that makes you reach for the ball, we a lot of times panic and try to hit that ball hard. And then somebody's sitting on top of the net blocking the volley, we're always in trouble. So being able to kind of have soft hands and hit a nice defensive shot when you're off balance and just regain your position. This drill helps me a lot. And, uh, yeah, it helps me stay in shape as well. So that's kind of my approach, but I know everybody is uh, very, very different in terms of the amount of time they like to spend on the court or the amount of drills they like to do. Maybe my only advice is if you're gonna skip steps, uh, never skip step one. And I find that actually happens quite a bit because a lot of people are drilling, but they don't know why and they don't not sure how to apply it. So um, I would emphasize trying to break it down conceptually and really understand why are you trying to learn this? How can it be used in the match? Um, and sometimes taking a step back, if, for example, you drilled and then you played some red games and you're still having a hard time executing it, taking a step back on the continuum and uh, maybe starting over is never a bad idea and just to kind of settle in into your system. Thank you. Do you think that one of the reasons you don't really like to drill that much is because you do a lot of coaching as well? <coughs> um, I think it just comes from my personality. You know, I'm a, you could say a little bit ADD or like social butterfly. So I like to move on from one thing to another. Um, and also I think bored? the fact that I play tennis a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be bored. I'd be basically bored drilling, but I think, the fact that I spent a lot of time practicing and drilling in tennis kind of gave me a foundation that maybe allows me to skip a few steps in, uh, in pickleball now and I can kind of figure things out on the go. But without tennis, it'll probably be a lot more difficult uh, right. not to drill whatsoever. Yeah. Are you still playing tennis? Um, I actually played a little bit during the lockdown because um, I don't know, there was just something different to do. And um, I was kind of appalled by how terrible I was. So then I got a little competitive and I actually ended up playing for maybe like three, four weeks, uh, just so I can <laughs> kind of hit the ball in the, like a. You're frozen again. She is in the middle of the woods, I believe. So uh, it's not a surprise, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys for the for the technical difficulties, but I'm back. <laughs> no worries. Um, we haven't got your video though. Oh yeah. Where is Let's she right see. now? Here. There we go. Where are you, Arena? 
I'm uh, in the Hood River area in Oregon. Oh, okay. Thanks. What's the um, painting behind you? What what does um represent? Uh, I mean, it is a powerful mural. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, like Oregon and Washington State is a huge uh, timber industry. So oh, maybe wow. it's like a little That's bit huge. like the life, right? The life of the lumberjack or something. I don't know what's happening here, but oh, so you're you're outside? Yeah. So. I think this mural kind oh, of represents wow. like a little bit the culture um, of this region and kind of what happens here. But yeah, lots of logging um, because it's very, uh, very, very green here, right? So logging mm. industry is uh, is big in the in this part of the country. Great. Right. Um, wow. You said you're on your way to see your family. Did they all follow you to the U.S. then? Uh, my extended family. Uh, my mom still lives in Russia, um, okay. and she's a little bit stuck right now uh, because, yeah, Moscow is still uh, kind of peaking with the cases. But um, I have extended family who live in Seattle. They moved there before me. My uncle, my step uncle, um, cousins. So I basically have like another three or four grandmas and aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews, cousins, and none of them are related to me by blood but they're all family through through my grandma that sounds lovely I think, we've got, I think we've got a bit of a signal problem as well though so uh, you cut out at the very end there but um uh, mm. it sounds um uh, uh like a lovely extended family um, yes. So before COVID-19, were you actually spending all your time on pickleball or do you have a job? Um, well, uh, I kind of have yeah, a couple of other jobs, um, but they're flexible and I can do them from anywhere in the world. Wow. Um, I do research for you know, a grand line for Tulane. So, um, that was kind of in exchange for teaching tennis. Uh, that's what I used to do before. I was coaching tennis. And when I moved to Arizona, I thought it would be a little too hot to be outside. So I switched gears slightly. Um, so pickleball probably takes uh, maybe just a little bit over uh, half of my time, maybe about 60%. And then I try to mix it up with, uh, with other things. You don't want to get bored, do you, Irina? I, uh, I can keep myself oh, entertained pretty good. I think I'm going to go. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Just joining you with my beverage. <laughs> Is everybody here? Is everybody here? Yes, there's 32 of us, Debbie. What? Whoa. And I'll guess... Um, but it would be cool. Sorry. Uh, no. It would be cool. I'm gonna Louis is gonna be the first person in the to go time. All right, Louis. <laughs> okay. So um Irina, you said it would be cool, but I couldn't hear what you said. Oh yeah, it would be cool to see uh who who Who's on the call? Uh, will be the first person oh. in uh, players in the United States. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Who would be the first person? Sorry. First person to play pickleball full time. Yes. Like, uh, like, Simo so like Simone. Yeah. I agree. But is, is nobody to, uh, oh, especially in Europe, you know? I think you're frozen again, Irina. I know, it's, it sounds a little bit like a, a musical instrument, actually, sometimes when she's talking, doesn't so it? Like a, or, <laughs> or robotic, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I think that what she said, it'll be interesting to see who's the first Sorry, guys. player who is full-time and in Europe. I think that's what she said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. It will okay. be Who do you game. think it will be? Well, I would have thought it'd be somebody like 
Ben Johns, someone like that, I would have thought, you know, somebody who's going to be making a load of money, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else got any guesses? For sure. No, no, yeah, I think it's a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult to make money to make a living from pickleball in Europe. So my guess would be somebody from America. Yeah, there's not exactly um, enough tournaments to be able to. Um, in fact, we don't even have money in Europe yet either, do we? So, although to be fair, there was a money tournament in um, Spain in March. It's the last tournament I think that took place. It was in Aragon, and uh, Louis Leville and. Um, uh, Thaddea Locke, they won some money, so as did Louis and um, uh, his partner, um, Anthony McKelvin. Um, Chris won a big ham. It was a massive great Serrano ham, but we thought we wouldn't <laughs> take it back on the plane with us, so we left it behind. Um, so uh, that was the first tournament with money or pr big prizes, you know, <laughs> and the last one this year. Well, you could, you could have cut these slices, Karen, and put it in, put it in the bag. I gave it to Carlos and Virginia. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you noticed that I gave it to them, but Chris Sorry. won it. <laughs> All his hard work and I gave it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they might still have it. How big, how big they are. It's so big. It's true. It lasts for ages, doesn't it? You're right. You're right. Yeah. Actually, I'm feeling a bit bad about that. I'm giving away his prizes. You know, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, unless anyone else has got any other questions for Irene, you know, I'm going to just keep going from this list. Yeah, I've got a question. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, during the uh, COVID-19, during the pandemic, um, what have you been doing? Have you been playing recently and uh, with what kind of restrictions, if any? Are you playing doubles or just singles or are you wearing a mask? Are you wiping down the balls? What are you doing to now as things are beginning to open up with the pandemic still around? Um, great question, Jimbo. Um, I was a little bit on the safer side. So I basically didn't really play pickleball since uh, the last tournament in March. Uh, right. for almost like two months, two and a half months. And when things started to open up a little bit, um, I have a couple of friends who have a private court in um, Tucson, Arizona. So we just go there, uh, play with a small group and take all the necessary precautions as far as wiping the equipment down before and after. And then I just try to um, yeah, play pickleball basically within family. And I've only played um, maybe one time with a little bit more people. But depends on the state. I think the states that I've been around, California and Oregon, are on the stricter side. Arizona is basically wide open. So they reopened a lot of clubs um, maybe just a couple of weeks ago. But I would personally just stay away from those situations. Even uh, if people were yeah. playing, I would stay away. So yeah. I, haven't, I haven't taught any camps or anything like this. But usually the camps I do uh, have anywhere from like 20 to 200 people. So... Uh, I definitely better wait <laughs> for for a while and hang out. <laughs> so I might uh, might see Tyson McGuffin in a couple of days uh, and play some pickleball with him. He lives in Idaho, which is not too far from where I'm right, right. now. Are you wearing I, a mask? Uh, no, I wasn't wearing a mask uh, while playing if, pickleball. If, even in, even in doubles. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I wasn't doing that. I do wear a mask if I go to a grocery store or if I order like takeout. Right. right. But um, sure. But yeah, I did as a joke uh, sure. show up and played uh, one game. I had like a ski mask and then I had a protective glass that I don't know people wear maybe when they're cutting something. So it was like <laughs> double layer of protection, and I just showed up like it like it as a joke and played one game, but it was fairly. Uh, uncomfortable okay. and uh, difficult to breathe, but I was overprotected. There, there's a photo like somewhere on the internet that on like Instagram or Facebook that popped out with me in that mask, but it was, it was pretty funny. I saw that. That was cute. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what has been your most satisfying win to date? Ooh. Um, I think 
I had a few uh, exciting wins. Um, I think it depends. Um, sometimes it's determined that you win that matters, and sometimes it's just kind of the match. Uh, maybe it was in the second round, but because yep. you were coming back from, from behind. Um, but I'm probably um, most proud of, uh, of maybe like some of my singles uh, victories. Like back in the day when I played Simone at Nationals, and I had to beat, um, I lost to Simone first and then I had to beat her again and then beat Lucy in the finals, double dip her for, uh, for gold medal. So that was pretty exhausting. And uh, all three of us battled super hard um, to, to kind of get through the term. And, you know, it's amazing in singles, you might have anywhere from like eight to 12 participants, but actually to get through the event with a back draw, it's very physically demanding and, uh, I don't know. Personally, I think that's how pickleball should reopen through singles and maybe tournaments can make adjustments and uh, bring things in slowly like that and just uh, see how, um, how, how people react, you know, maybe be a little bit more on the safer side. Yeah, because we can do uh, singles even if it's not the whole court, right? So, yeah. Mm. So. And... Um, I don't know. I was uh, always have a good time playing at uh, at the U.S. Open. Um, I think it's uh, as you guys know, U.S. Open is in Florida, so they have a little bit of home crowd thing going on for some of the players from Florida, like Kyle Yates and Simone, and uh, both of them have uh, incredible record nice. at the tournament. They've won a well, lot of matches, so yeah. Nice. So if you beat one of those guys at, on their home court, that's uh, that's always nice, and especially uh, under the lights, you know. In the in the finals uh, atmosphere, that's pretty pretty exciting. Just to be able to play off the crowd, they're fair, you know. They love their their floor, the crew, but at the same time, they're very fair. And uh, if it's a great pickleball, everybody's into it and supporting you. So it's a very nice environment um, to be in. And that's that's another thing I enjoy about European pickleball. And uh, the French and the Spanish really have been setting the tone for cheering for each other. Uh, getting in the groups, you know, getting some flags waving, yeah. uh, doing the dances. So that's one aspect uh, of, uh, of pickleball I enjoy is the, the atmosphere. And in Europe, is even we have even more options, right? Because we can have all different countries cheering for each other, bringing flags and yeah. competing yeah. like that. So hope the French quick, and the Spanish quick. keep going. Oh, they will. They will. There's nothing quick, to stop quick, <laughs> quick comment. Quick comment and a question. The comment is that you know the U.S. Open Arena, um, A R E N A, not I R E I N A. <laughs> the the uh, arena, the whole um, top of it, you know, the cover has been torn to shreds. Oh. So it's off, and they're having to build um, an entire new cover in which they're currently engaged. It's, it's totally ripped off with the winds and rain. Um, my question to you, Irina, is in terms of singles, which I know you love to play and I love to play, what are the one or two most important things about, in your view, about playing that game successfully after, after serve or even with serve? What, what's the strategy and how does it differ from doubles? Um, I think in singles, you can serve and return a little bit more aggressively uh, than in doubles. Um, I'm definitely a player who tries to use a serve to set up a favorable third shot because the better I serve, the easier my third shot will be. So I prefer to use a mix of uh, different serves. So sometimes I go for the power. Sometimes I go for maybe like off pace lob or off pace slice serve, maybe an angle. But just play around with my serves depending on the opponent and see which serve gives me the best third shot. Uh, so I can either dip it low or hit a passing shot and take over the net. So I, uh, that's a good point. I serve bigger in singles and try to dictate um, my points with a serve. And then the same thing on the return. Uh, I try to return as good as I can do to get to the kitchen and make their third shot more difficult. Um, in recent times, especially in uh, women's singles pickleball, uh, there's been a little bit more baseline play. 
And because uh, ladies have gotten really good at hitting passing shots, so they kind of adjusted their strategy, and now people either play from the baseline or wait for an opportunity to come in, maybe not immediately after the return. So you have to read the situation as well. So if maybe your initial plan is try to get to the kitchen line, but you're getting passed left and right, you have to time it a little bit better. You have to figure out what is a better opportunity to come in and be willing to play a little bit of uh, baseline. So more like tennis-like uh, pickleball. So those are different strategies slightly. Is that because the tennis players are beginning to inundate the pickleball game itself and they're hitting from the backcourt? The passing shots have gotten better. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. and a lot of players have a uh, tennis background, but yes, people, uh, instead of just hitting a third shot drop, as maybe it was a starting point, you know, in, in singles, people can hit flat passing shots, people can roll incredible angles, like Anna Lee, for example, can hit like a two-handed backhand angle. Simone is very good at hitting angles and disguising her shots, so I think just uh, because the quality has gone up so much, people had to adjust and mix in different styles on your when you're serving <clears throat> in singles and the ball comes back your third shot are you trying to go deep um backhand or forehand and immediately come to net uh depends where i'm hitting my third shot from if i'm in a good position and the ball is in front of me i can look to be more aggressive and then almost from any other position, like neutral or defensive, I um, probably will look to dip my third shot using a little bit of topspin or a little bit of slice and then find my way to the net. So usually you don't get a chance to pass them right away and you have to set up the point by hitting your third shot low, very much like in doubles, and finding a way to the net, either with a swinging volley or maybe wait a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. When we were um, at the uh, World Championships, um, Vivian David was playing and she seemed to upset things a bit. Is that because everyone hadn't played her before? And so it was a new player. And so, you know, you, you didn't have really, because it was rally scoring, you didn't really have time to figure out her game. Is that what was going on? Well, I think uh, two, happen two things happened. Vivian, first of all, is a very good player, also with a tennis background, and she just had an amazing day. So I think. Uh, if you guys compete in sports, you're going to have those days where anything you touch turns into gold. Um, matches like this are scarce, you know, in my tennis and pickleball career, probably had maybe 10, 15 matches each, if that, uh, where I played so good, where I didn't have to think about it and just everything goes in. So Vivian was definitely having a tournament like this because she got through me, she got through Lucy, didn't have any problems. And maybe, yeah, the scoring in a little bit different format. Uh, contributed to that um, but basically we just got outplayed so I would give all the all the credit to Vivian and she just played incredible we were like comparing her to Djokovic and Federer because she was <laughs> she was just toying with us so you know you just take a loss and move on and then try to win the, the next time <laughs> well, that's very magnanimous of you anyway um, how many countries have you visited so far because of pickleball? Um, a bunch. So let's see, Spain, France, um, that's where we played for Italy. And uh, those were specifically for pickleball. And then usually when I travel around, I look for pickleball now. So I found some pickleball in, uh, in Hong Kong and played a little bit there. And um, Let's see, there's some pickleball in Shenzhen, and I'm hoping to go back and play in the Philippines. Oh, I play pickleball in Thailand. Oh. Just randomly saw a person with a paddle with a tennis club and I asked them about pickleball. And then next thing we knew, we had like two groups and just playing. And so did it was you nice. Plan? Actually, Elaine uh, organized all that. Oh, great. Ron, were you trying to say something? Well, I just, I missed, did you mention France? You were at the French Open. Yes. Yeah. And I, I thought it was cool. I thought it was cool that when Irina plays, so that wasn't a sanctioned tournament, 
So what she does is she tells the local people, hey, set me up with the youth who's pretty good and I want to play with someone like that. So I think that's cool. Sorry, whoever's yeah. pickleball, could they please mute, please? I heard, I heard, I heard a pablum ball going. I really did. <laughs> yes, you, <laughs> you, 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 you did. You actually did. I just came out to uh, <clears throat> some pickleball courts where I will walk off of or mute it. Where it, where it. I just muted you, Jim. Don't worry. Um, I've got power <laughs> here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, Meet everybody. Uh, yeah, you were set. You were in the middle of saying countries: um, Hong Kong, Xing, Xinjiang, which I think is um, China, right? Um, Thailand. Mm -hmm. Was that the um, end of the list? Um, yeah, I think that's the end of the list. And then yeah. I visited some countries after pickleball, um, just for fun. So I just got to travel a little bit more to Portugal and. Uh, other places in Europe. So it's always it's always a great opportunity to see the good old Europe, hang out with all of you guys, have some espressos. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Mega, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask Irina a, a question? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, I really wanted to know that any plans for India? I'm from India, hi. And hi. just wanted to know you have, you have come so close to Asia, like, all, all the countries so any plans for India yes I would love to go to India um, one of my good friends lives in Chennai and uh, through Sunil uh, I just kind of connected those two guys and maybe he'll he's also a tennis player uh, Jivan and uh, hopefully he'll start playing some pickleball as well but I would love to go to India uh, bounce around visit different cities um, would be Actually, it would be awesome to go right now where it's not as crowded. Imagine going through Mumbai right now without all the crazy traffic. That's Just true. That's true. I think this is the best time. But then again, the pandemic is it's, it's not good. So hopefully see you soon in India. We would love to have you. Yes. And uh, if we really dream big, if I go to India, it would be amazing to attend and um, a wedding because I know you guys take it to like the next level, right? And it's a celebration for a couple of weeks. So that would be um, also awesome to check it out. So maybe somebody, you, you somebody to, can get married. You, you need to dress up, Arena. <laughs> Mega. That's true. That's true. That's true. I mean, the tournaments is equivalent to wedding. I mean, we, we celebrate like, like it's a wedding. We do everything. And especially you'll have lots of food. <laughs> So you have to come yeah. empty stomach <laughs> for two weeks. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So we awesome. can we can already plan to do like a, a big production video, like Bollywood style, to take down the French. Because <laughs> remember, French did a pretty yes. good job, right, with their pickleball dance. But I think if we do something in India, like there's I mean, no way they can they can keep up with that us. That was cool. It was yes, really that's cool a pretty cool right idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has anyone else got nice. a question or should I go back to the, uh, the list I have? Uh, I've got, I got a question, Irina. I, I want to ask you, in the, um, with, the, with the tournaments coming up, so uh, who are your partners, mixed and, and doubles? And will you, will you change your partners or will you keep the same partners wherever you go and play? Um, usually you kind of set up partners for maybe for like a year and then maybe you mix a few different partners based on availability. So if tournaments resume in August and in the fall, um, I have uh, one event uh, with Callie Smith and then uh, all my fall events and winter events are with Jesse Irvine. And then for um, mixed, I have Eric Lang. I don't know if you guys know him, really tall guy, uh, maybe 6'5". So, oh. so oh, he'll yeah. just do all the work for me. Um, and then uh, for next year, basically, you have to kind of reset and uh, decide. We, I might play a couple of events with Eric again and Tyson and Callum Dawson. He's one of my favorite partners. He's back. Um, I don't know if you guys know, there's a wonderful uh, pickleball and tennis club in California. It's called uh, Bobby Riggs Tennis and Pedal in Encinitas. And uh, the Dawsons, Stephen Jennifer Dawson and Callum Dawson, they own uh, the club. And they're a huge pickleball family. Steve and Jennifer Dawson, they're obviously the top senior players. And then Callan Dawson is one of the um, 
really good pros as well, maybe like top 15 in men. So if you're ever in the United States, it's a good place uh, to play some tournaments. They host many events, including SoCal Classic. Uh, Ron probably been there many times. And um, it's a very classic, you know, Southern California, like surfer lifestyle, laid back atmosphere where you just uh, hang out at the club, have a coffee, have a smoothie, go to the beach, you know, go to uh, meditate. There, there's like a little meditation and you area. There. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Is it Debbie? Uh, where, is the, where are you from? I think Debbie's from California. Is that is that near where you're from, Debbie? We can't hear you. I think you're you're mute. You're on mute, Debbie. Maybe she oh, stepped away. She can't. <laughs> um, I okay. think she's from Santa Barbara. Uh, there we go, not too far, a little bit more north from uh, Encinitas, mm -hmm. San Diego area. Yeah. Uh, cool. The next question I have here is what is your dream for pickleball in the future? Well, I think there are definitely um, a number of avenues. Um, maybe first is kind of professional pickleball avenue. It would be nice to have actually a professional worldwide tour similar to maybe tennis and other sports where um you know events have a little bit more consistency and everybody's kind of on the same page and it's a little bit more uh player oriented and there's a bigger effort to kind of promote the sport promote all the players like all top 25 players pay them a little bit more and have spectators that's probably and you probably need like a unified ranking system for that and uh, a few things to happen. But I think there are steps being taken in the right direction. And hopefully people continue to work together and kind of collaborate uh, to produce a better experience for everybody, the players, the spectators, the tournament hosts and so forth. And I think the, the second dream is probably something that we all share in common is try to see uh, pickleball in the Olympics and creating grassroots le uh, efforts in different countries. Ron probably knows some actual specific details on how to get there. And there are different organizations that are working on it. That maybe is another issue because we have some organizations trying to do the same thing, but they're not necessarily working together. So that could be maybe a different angle at how to make things happen faster and look for collaborating a little bit more. Um, and probably the third thing about Pickleball is um, making it a little bit more junior friendly and making it a little bit more popular with younger players. Uh, we've been doing a lot of that in the United States. I think we're pretty successful, you know, kind of trying to promote uh, Pickleball through the United States Pickleball Association. They do junior events, they do junior parties. And kind of my friends and I, um, you know, as part of Sick Tricks, uh, we've always uh, tried to work with juniors and hang out with them and promote creativity and exploration and not just like drilling and rigidly like being disciplined and training, just exploring and creating your own style um, in Pickleball. So seeing uh, more events for juniors, seeing more opportunities for juniors to kind of hang out and practice and do something with a sport would be the third avenue uh, of, the, of the big vision. They're, they're great vision I, um, uh, ideas, I, I, and I, I can um, uh, also um, uh, say that I'm really looking forward to um, uh, there being like Grand Slam tournaments around the world, a bit like the tennis world. That would be wonderful. Um, I'd also love one of those to be in England. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, did, I did play. Oh, sorry. No, go on, go on. You just played. I did play, I don't know if you guys saw, I did play pickleball on grass court one time. And uh, it was uh, Carl Schmidt's idea, who uh, who is with Pro Pickleball, that's his company. And he's one of the people who is um, streaming pickleball. A lot of what you guys uh, might see online probably yeah. come, come from Carl. And he has been to Bainbridge Cup in Spain, in Madrid, yeah. and he was at the French Open and the Spanish Open this last year. So, um, Oh, where where was I going with that? You I played totally on you played on grass. Oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so yeah, Carl. It was Carl's idea, and he found a club in Arizona that had a grass court, and we uh, played pickleball, and it was Joey Frias, uh, myself, and the Newmans. We dressed in all white, 
except Joey had black shorts. <laughs> but, <laughs> and we tested a bunch of pickleballs, and of course, none of them would bounce. So what we did as a compromise, we just had one of those foam balls that we played, and we used that bounce pretty high. But of course, uh, it was very, uh, it was pretty interesting to play it. I think it would be quite an adjustment to yeah. get it, and it was very slippery. I remember falling but gracefully rebounding afterwards, but I definitely ate shit playing on the grass court fairly quickly. <laughs> gracefully rebounding. How do you do that, Gra? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, has anyone else got any questions for Irina after listening to her talking? Is there anything else that comes to mind? Don't be shy. You can raise your hand. You can oh, use the... One. Daryl, oh. go ahead. Hi, Irina. Um, Hello. How many paddles do you um, keep in your bag? And do you have a favourite one that you play with? Um, I usually keep anywhere between two to four paddles, depending on my travel arrangements. And I always have a favourite paddle, and I play with it until it's uh, broken or dead or stolen. I don't know whatever happens. So I try to play with it as long as I can. It definitely varies. You could be anywhere to a, from like six months to a year to just a couple of weeks. And um, I have, uh, sometimes I play with a different paddle for singles in a way that I put a little bit more weight around the top of the edge of the paddle. So uh, it gives me a little bit more power on my shots and I can hit some drives on the passing shots and then I play with a slightly lighter paddle for doubles so I can still maintain my reflexes and quickness and I usually have enough power to hit balls from the kitchen in doubles. Okay and is it top do you use tops paddles or? No, paddle tech. Paddle tech. I have paddle okay. tech. Paddle tech okay fair enough my fault. Yeah Oh, no, no problem. But basically, um, yeah, we had the same paddle for forever, for about five years. And uh, last summer, um, Paddle Tech, we were kind of like experimenting with new designs. Uh, both Kyle Yates and I were doing kind of the same thing. We were experimenting with new designs, maybe a longer grip, maybe slightly different shape. That's why you guys saw some different paddles at the French Open and the Spanish Open. They're just prototypes for us to play around. Oh. But after extensive uh, research and development, we kind of concluded that the existing paddle is actually the best one and uh, what works for both of us is just calibrating it a little bit uh, with the weight um, with the lead tape to fit the conditions um, you know if it's windy or if it's humid you can kind of play around with how much weight you you put on and then you finally find the sweet spot because you guys know you right you take a paddle you hit a few balls and you know immediately if the paddle feels right. right. For me, sometimes I don't even have to hit with the paddle. So like I tried some other ones and I hold the paddle. I'm like, ooh, I know this is gonna be an incredible paddle. And I hold another paddle. I'm like, there's no way I can hit a ball with it. So I'm very, very intuitive like that. Thank you. So what is the weight uh, that you prefer? Uh, eight, two, eight ounce, 8.2 okay. ounces. And then if I put so less tape, it comes out to 8.36. Okay, so quite heavy, actually. It's probably, yeah, on a slightly heavier side. Yeah. A lot of people play with maybe under 8 ounces. Mm -hmm. That was Tuomo from Finland. I don't, didn't know if you could see him um, asking. Um, I keep, uh, yeah, I keep scrolling through um, all right. my window because I can't see everybody on the phone no. at the same time. So I try to <laughs> move around when somebody is asking the question and I can see their face. <laughs> um, has anyone else got any questions for uh, Irina? Hi, Irina, it's Sarah Aiken, and we were in France together and I saw a video with you and Kyle making this fantastic baguette sandwich with the jambon. And I was wondering if you have any other special recipes and are you considering bringing out a pickleball recipe book anytime soon? Wow, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, yes, Kyle and I, we probably ate about 150 baguettes while we were in France and it never got old. It was amazing. 
And uh, since then, we actually had another episode of uh, hanging out in the kitchen, and Kyle showed up on Eddie and Webby show. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Eddie and Webby show podcast. So I was a guest, and then Kyle showed up, and we were making tacos. So it was instead of Monsignor the baguette, it was Senor Taco, and he made some tacos in the kitchen. Unfortunately, we didn't get to eat them like the baguette. Um, and uh, I don't know. When I travel, I think I like to eat uh, whatever is the specialty of the region. So I'm pretty lucky that I eat everything. So same thing in U.S. or Europe. Anywhere you go, you just find some local delicacies and you go. And that's another good reason because if, as long as I play pickleball, especially as long as I play singles, I can eat as much as I want, whenever I want, and I can eat anything I want. So that's also a big motivation for, for playing pickleball. I don't really have to work out and I can eat whatever. So you've, you've answered my next question. You don't have a special diet or routine that you follow then? Uh, no, I just try to give myself enough time to process the food, you know, from the time I eat it to the time I have to play. And um, when I play tournaments in, um, in the U.S. and uh, weather conditions are pretty demanding, like it's too hot, I want to make sure I kind of hydrate. Um, you know, take some electrolytes and um, maybe take some magnesium to, to recover. So um, that's, that helps a lot. And usually it takes like three or four days before the tournament to start the process to make sure I can go through the tournament and uh, not cramp and so yeah actually you said about not cramping um I, it just reminded me of the jigsaw adverts i have to say my favorite one was lucy um do, taking a, a swipe at your sign not today irena <laughs> yes um that was a pretty classic commercial i don't know if you guys have seen them but uh yeah we were pretty lucky that jigsaw health actually found us um they approached us at nationals and asked if we would try their products and if we like them, they can really help us take care of the preparation and the recovery part for the tournaments. And uh, that's been amazing ever since. I think it made a difference uh, for everybody in terms of how we feel during the events and we're able to play a little bit longer and not have to i don't know if you guys ever cramped and you didn't really have anything and so then your options would be pickle juice right your options would be mustard so i don't know if anybody tried to eat a couple of packets of mustard in uh, atlanta with 100 percent humidity and probably like 38 degrees celsius that was not very pleasant experience i thought i took like a time out in the fourth set at the atlanta open because i was about to cramp to eat some mustard packets and it was very, very brutal. So now if I can just drink in a, a fruity electrolyte drink and never eat mustard again, I'm all for it. What's in mustard that makes it good for cramp? I didn't know that. Um, well, it probably has like a good amount of salt and maybe a good amount of potassium. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it helped me. I was, you know, just besides the taste, it actually did the trick. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think that mustard sounds a little, uh, I think I'd rather take electrolytes, definitely. <laughs> Has anyone else yes. got any questions for Irina? Don't be shy. Well, uh, another uh, equipment related one. So uh, I assume you obviously uh, like to play with DuraFast 40 when outdoors. What's your next favorite uh, outdoor ball and, and what about indoor balls? Um, great and question. Why? And why? Uh, yeah, great question. I definitely prefer Dura because um, it fits my game better. Like my game style, I like to spin the ball, so either slice or top spin. And then Dura has the best response from what I give it to the ball. It takes on it really well. So it gives me an advantage when mm -hmm. I play. Um, for players, for example, who just hit like half volleys and no spin, probably they prefer a different ball. So, but I do kind of, kind of coming from the tennis perspective, you know how tennis has uh, Grand Slam events and tournaments on different surfaces. They also use different balls. 
I think there is no shame in pickleball in using different ball and players having to adjust. Even though if I play, let's say, with a Franklin ball, right, there's a more predictable, more consistent bounce and the ball takes on the spin a little bit less, that takes away from my game. But if I'm going to consider myself a professional player, I should be able to adjust my game style, right, to suit the ball and to suit uh, different conditions. And so far, I think as long as it doesn't get like too hot, Franklin plays pretty good. We've had a little bit of problems, but again, it was like 40 degrees, you know, 40 degrees Celsius. That's just unreasonable heat anyway. Um, so it should be. I kind of, I kind of, yeah. I like the the aspect where I have to adjust my game to suit the style, and the same thing happens uh, indoor. I think I've only played like with an onyx like jug ball indoor, and same thing. It doesn't really spin much. Um, so I have to adjust my game style a little bit, get a couple of extra days of practice before, and um, off I go. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Hi, Arena. It's uh, Dave here. Hello, Arena. hello. Hi there. Um, yeah, just to say many, many thanks on behalf of all of us for your time this evening. Really, really great to hear what you've got to say. Um, I just got to say it's a big, um, a big thank you to you because I remember playing against you in the 2016 and 17 US Open. And um, what I thought was really great was in 2017, you remembered playing little old me from uh, sunny Margate in Kent. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I just want to say you're a, a really, really good player, but what are you going to do to get number one position? I probably will have to start <laughs> drilling, I think. <laughs> yeah. You don't like drilling. After today, you will know. That's what they say. Um, well, I think to, yeah, probably just go a little bit more, be a little bit more committed in terms of like preparation, recovery, and skip, probably play a little bit more tournaments. Um, take care of fitness a little bit. Uh, work on a couple of things and um, yeah and then I'll probably be um, a contender. So we see you in uh, 2022 in uh, the English Open no doubt. I hope so especially if it's close to Wimbledon you know how to get me there pretty easy. Fantastic thank you. <laughs> or so World Cup. We know, yeah looking forward to we We've got to avoid major uh, US tournaments it's got to be near the time of um, Wimbledon. <laughs> Any other special requests? <laughs> um, well, I mean, if the queen is available, that's fine. I would love to say hi. <laughs> oh, dear. Lovely. Has anyone else got any questions for Irina? Is it important for you to be number one? Um... I think yes, but it's probably not like an overwhelming, overdriving force. Um, but it would definitely would bring a great sense of uh, accomplishment. I'm just waiting for the rankings. If there is a ranking, so I will know for sure I'm number one. Like right now, it would be hard to tell. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, hey, Irina, I did mention to Pat Murphy the other day that you and Kyle wanted to be involved in that committee. So there you go. There we go. Nice. <laughs> you, nice. you can just put your name at the top of the list. <laughs> Anyone else got a question? Yes, I do. Hi, Irina. I live in Orlando. Um, we have seven hard courts that are actually indoors. Have you played on hard courts in an indoor environment? And if so, do you enjoy that type of play? Uh, yes, I've played a couple of times. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's fine. It's maybe not my favorite experience, experience but um, it is nice to have like consistent bounce. And again, it probably takes away from my game because I can usually adjust like the more windy it is, the more sunny it is, the more conditions are weird. I think the better it is for me because I can kind of adjust my game and play around with things. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes if conditions are perfect, the players that might have more power than me, uh, it will probably be favorable to them because the ball is bouncing 
identical every single time, right? And it's harder for me to junk ball them and take them take away their rhythm. So just maybe for me, not enough variables, right? For the for indoor pickleball, everything is like too perfect, and my game works a little bit better when things are variable. In singles and doubles, <clears throat> who do you regard as your toughest opponents? Um, well, kind of the usual suspects, you know, um, the Waters, uh, Simone, Lucy, um, Catherine Esperanto is always tough to tough to play, Jesse Irvine. So now I think you, uh, the depth of the top players has uh, extended a little bit. So instead of maybe being just like three players for a while, like Simone, Lucy and I, now the field is a little bit deeper and we actually have maybe eight to 10 female players that could win the tournament on any given day and kind of depending on the partnership. So that's actually great to see. And uh, of course it's more challenging, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's more exciting. And uh, when I play mixed, usually people who give me trouble are um, unorthodox players. So I don't know if you guys know Jeff Warnick. Um, he is a really tall guy. He favors his backhand quite a bit. And he has like an extreme grip and he just like punches everything like this and he can reach really far inside the kitchen and he has like incredible shots. Sometimes this guy goes on like winning streaks where he just wins like 15 points in a row playing really fast and all of them last like maybe one or two shots. So very difficult to settle in against a player like this, find rhythm and control the ball away from him. So sometimes I've struggled against unorthodox players that I can't really read their shots or they do things differently than me. And who did you say that player was? The tall guy? Uh, his name, yeah, Jeff Warnick. He plays Thank a lot of mixed doubles with Jesse Irvine. Also has the furthest paddle throw in the history of uh, pickleball. Well, as in throwing his paddle. Yeah, he threw a boomerang his paddle pretty far one time. And uh, yeah, I think, he's kind of like- I think it covered four courts. Oh my God, that's dangerous though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I think much like uh, Nick Kyrgios, if you guys know who Nick Kyrgios is in, uh, in tennis, he, uh, Jeff is, uh, um, is a balancing act between bringing his personality into, um, into uh, the tournaments and kind of being a little bit more, um, you know, entertaining and also potentially walking sometimes a dangerous line of, uh, oh, that pedal could have hit somebody. But it's nice, uh, it's nice to have, um, again, adversity like this in pickleball. Not everybody is like cookie cutter, you know, you go between the points, you shake your hands and you get a little more passion, a little bit more adversity in the matches. So I like uh, what Jeff uh, brings to the game. And I think he's going to, he's definitely going to find a good balance on how to contribute to the sport with his personality and his passion. So it's good to have him. He's, he's definitely not cookie cutter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen <clears throat> and Arena. I got to go back to uh, police issues here in Minneapolis. <clears throat> um, I'm losing my voice. Irina, you're terrific. You're sweet. You're smart. And you're, uh, you're funky. We love you. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Karen, and everybody for arranging this. We'll see you, Jimbo. And thank you, Jimbo. I'll see, Jimbo. I'll see you soon. Okay. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, so, Jimbo. Irina. Bye-bye, Ron. Bye, Ron. Bye, Jimbo. Bye, everybody. Bye, Ron. Bye, Jimbo. Hi. Um, so, Irina, I have a question for you. What does it take to take your cap off, or to get you to take your cap off, or do you sleep with it? Is it always on your head? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you. Oh, my head! I mean, question. I can take it off. I haven't showered in like three days, but I've been in the river and hot springs, so I think I'm pretty clean. There you go. <laughs> wow! For the first time ever, we see you without the cap. That's yeah. It. Oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. And then it's not bad for at home haircut too. My you girlfriend cut, cut my hair, so no, my girlfriend cut it for me, so that's pretty good. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah, that's a nice nice hair. You should you should you know Right? Yeah. Yeah. Play some I can't play cut. I can't play without a hat because it's in my eyes. But I definitely sometimes I show up without a hat. <laughs> but did you wear a cap indoors in Italy though? 
yes <laughs> i have to wear indoor indoor or outdoor doesn't matter because i can't see without it okay, okay. all right <laughs> any more questions for irena Do you have a, a, a mantra, Irina, like when you, before you go and play it, like in, let's say in, a, in the US Open or the Nationals, you know, before you, end, you start a match, is there a mantra that you repeat to yourself to motivate yourself or to, to keep you positive? Yeah, pull your head out of your ass. <laughs> 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 I'm usually very direct, you know. Yeah, I'm usually very direct. Um, like a funny, um, a funny episode is when Lucy and I play in doubles, and sometimes uh, Matt Wright would come on the court to uh, give us a couple of tips. And like the way he was talking to Lucy is like very delicate, you know, like very sensitive, very delicate, very positive. And then I'm like, Matt, if you need to tell me something, you know you can tell me a little bit more straight up because sometimes if you like if you're so positive then i'm thinking i'm doing fine you know <laughs> so we're kind of always joking about it that i can i can kind of take it directly you don't have to sugarcoat it for me <laughs> <laughs> who, who has been your favorite partner in terms of communications so far today um, I mean, Lu I really enjoy playing with yeah, Lucy and uh, Jesse. Um, Lucy has like a very fiery personality. And uh, I think we kind of spend a lot of time actually, like we click really well, um, usually in the game that we can afford to spend some time just joking around and talking about like other people's outfits or just making fun of them or I don't know, doing like a little bit of gossip. I think with Jesse, you have to focus a little bit more. So I was telling myself to like be more serious when I play with Jesse. And then Jesse told me she was telling herself to loosen up a little bit so we can kind of connect in the, in the middle. But uh, I don't know. I think it's just, yeah, as long as my partner is kind of, you know, knows when to be in the zone, I prefer a lighter kind of conversation and just cruising and hanging out having a good time in the match so it's been nice to play with those girls great do you go back to Russia very often uh no not really I haven't been in over 10 years oh wow uh yeah so we'll see I should have gone for the world cup soccer but I missed well, maybe that opportunity you go back to Russia you'll have to take pickleball there with you and uh you know demonstrate it to everyone there. <laughs> yeah, I think there are people starting to hear a little bit uh, about pickleball in Russia, but nothing like formal yet. But I think that would be, that would be pretty cool. Mm, definitely. Well, just reminding you, Irina, that Finland is just next to Russia. So it's, uh, we are very close if you ever come to Russia. <laughs> yes, in the, in the winter, let's do a tour of uh, Finland and Russia in the winter and just do some ice fishing, some sledding. Yeah. <laughs> you loved, You're you loved welcome. Sports, You're welcome. You? But thank you, yes. You loved winter sports, don't you? I can snowboard a little bit, yeah. I have a good time. Um, I, when I used to live in Seattle, I would always go across the border to Canada, and then uh, you can go a little bit more north to Whistler. Uh, that was the site where they had the Olympics like maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And it's, of course, like a world-class uh, ski resort and a couple of mountains. So um, I try to go there as many, as much as I can. But I probably prefer to travel, you know, and snowboard than actually live in the winter. I like the warm weather now. Right, right. <laughs> Any other questions uh, for Irina? Uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have a question, Irina. Uh, Lucy didn't want to answer this question, uh, but let's see if you, if you answer or are you, are you answer it. So we okay. ask we ask Lucy, what's your <laughs> what's your weakness or you have any weakness uh, in, in in playing and and if you do if you have one which one it is so do you have a weakness uh, that you, you you try to improve all the time? Um, well, I think there's a, I mean there's a little bit of difference, right? If there's a weakness you're trying to cover, or if maybe there's a new skill that you try to um, try to add, so. I think in terms of like new skills, I've uh, 
definitely added like two-handed backhand and then two-handed backhand passing shot in singles. And I'm kind of working on maybe adding a little bit more lobs and doubles, uh, especially from the kitchen. Uh, and in terms of like weakness, I think, I think it's just like ability to kind of concentrate. I mean, I really admire Simone and, and like Jesse for that matter. There are a number of players where like every match they play, they're basically at 100% concentration level, 100% focus. Um, for me, it's a little bit difficult to get there all the time. So that's one area that I try to uh, be a little bit more conscious of and be a little bit more deliberate in how to put myself in a better position and give myself time to settle into the match and kind of come uh, mentally mentally prepared. But um, yes, like you can count on Simone or Jesse like being dialed in into the spot like every single time from very first ball to very last ball in. That's something I, I need to improve. I mean, I think it's impossible to expect that from myself every single time, but the matches that are important, I probably want to be a little bit more consistent and kind of getting into the zone to that level. Do you beat yourself up if you don't do things well or do you just let it go? Well, I definitely would like to throw like a pity party for maybe like the first 10 minutes after the match if I didn't play good um, or whatever reason. And then you know, once the pity party is over, hey, what's up? I kind of move on. So probably one, I mean, I might lose my sleep over it a couple of times too, but usually I can uh, release and let go after a 10 minute break. So if I'm walking off the match and not making eye contact, I'm going to try to find a spot <laughs> and hide out for 10 minutes and calm down. <laughs> I've just noticed yeah. what the app says actually. It says living the dream. Are you living the dream? Uh, I mean, I think today for sure. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else got any questions for Irina? Uh, Leo, Leo has just joined us. Hola, Leo. Leo. Hi, Leo. Where is the beard? Dave? <laughs> what about Dave Weinbach? Did he have any weaknesses? How did he handle that question? Oh, we did ask that question. We forgot. Um, uh, she was talking it was about very funny. Lucy, Lucy was very... Yeah, he was talking more skills and drills and focus and, you know, your, your, your uh, interview has been much more conversational. He was, you know, just cheer cheerleader type. Go for it. Do it. You can do this and that sort of thing. He was teaching us the third shot drop. Obviously, obviously. <laughs> nice. How is uh, how is Simone? Was she also pretty serious? <laughs> she was with Chad, uh, and um, they they were um, talking a, uh, a lot about a drills and and you know teaching and things like that. But they were also talking about um, communications between them and how they see things differently. Uh, uh, it's actually very interesting to see the husband wife by play. Uh, going on with those two? Yes. Um, a few times um, we've done some like events and exhibitions together. So we play around. And then one time I was playing with Simone against uh, Chad and uh, maybe like another uh, player from, from a camp or a clinic. And it was the funniest thing ever. It was, um, it was, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> they definitely don't give each other a break on the pickleball court. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely what husbands and wives are like, anyway, right? <laughs> she was, yeah, she was saying that um, because she plays with Ben, and Ben is like twenty years younger. So, um, you know, she was saying that you know, um, you know, she can feel the difference in age. You know, but, you know, Ben is a lot fitter. You know, he, he covers a lot of the court. You know, when they play together. Um, so you know, she was saying, you know, she was happy for him to, you know, to step in and poach all the time. You know, uh, you know, they, yeah, that was an agreement they had, and then she but was happy was with that. the funniest thing, though, Roberto, it, 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 to me, was that she kept calling him kid, kid, kid. <laughs> yeah. And when she talks to him, she calls yeah. him kid as well. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Ben. Ben's got a little bit of uh, growing up uh, to do, you know. But um, he is definitely an awesome partner. What I notice when I play with him is sometimes I gotta let him take a nap in the middle of the day. You gotta and let him have a nap. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess he does like a lot of work and like every if I play with Ben, I think we should also probably slightly different approach when Simone plays mm-hmm. with him. When Ben and I just try to hit like as many trick shots as possible. So we're both just flying around, poaching, just doing random things. So then of course he gets tired, let him take take a nap, and then he comes back ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta observe. You gotta observe your partners. You know, I think, and read their body language and their emotions. And just... yeah, but how do you normally tell someone to have a nap? That's quite a difficult conversation to have, I think. <laughs> well, I think with Ben, it's pretty easy. Like his energy level gets like really low. Well. He starts walking really slow, and uh, his shoulders are kind of down, and he's like reaching for the ball. So I'm like, okay, nap time. <laughs> Has anyone got any um, more questions for Irina? If not, we'll let her go back to her weekend. <laughs> back into the woods. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Irina. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank yeah. Thanks, you Thanks Irina. Really yeah, thank you for all. Thank you, Irina. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so Bye, much. Good, good tradition. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Have a good Thank one. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye guys. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.